Coming up on today's show. We just mallard hybrid and a wood duck mallard hybrid, which is the unicorn. Uh, I, I, anytime you see that many hybrids mm-hmm. in one season, that's just true. Every set of bibs I've ever owned, uh, this is the main thing that stuck out to me. Corey's a little weird, but you're welcome <laughs> back anytime. <laughs> Broadcasting from the Mid-Migration Outfitter Studios, this is the Finding Fur and Feathers Hunting Podcast. How much direction are you getting from the governor? The Minnesota DNR had reintroduced him into this area. I don't know, maybe you didn't want me to tell the story on the show, but I'm going to tell it's it anyway. I, I knew you were going to go there. I'm going to close the entire hunting season. Oh, well, really? That's pretty easy. Finding Fur and Feathers Hunting Podcast is brought to you by Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. By Haybale Heights on Devil's Lake. Visit haybaleheights.com for more. By Ottertail County. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. And by Lake of the Woods Tourism. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. We've been on the road uh, with Corey Loeffler here for the last... Well, I don't even know how, how many days it's been. We're, we're only about halfway through the trip. Right now we're in Oklahoma at Falco. We just got done smashing a whole bunch of birds. Uh, little geese, mallards, uh, there were snow geese around, a lot of pintails. And you guys down here, before we get into this, you guys down here get the good pintails, by the way. We don't get them with those big sprigs back up north when we see them up there. You guys get them down here. So uh, it's been a great time. So uh, we've got uh, J.D. Blagg and Aaron Seafritz with us how are you guys doing fantastic all right yeah great yep. have to grab the mic there okay. we're fantastic per- <laughs> perfect right. well hey man you guys got a great operation here thanks for having us thank you so much um tell our listeners what you do here yeah we had, uh falco is a um, cooperative of uh i guess a handful of guides that uh, we all originally started in arkansas and have a you know background in the hunting industry and um we have a about a 7,500 square foot lodge, and we host 16 guests at a time throughout the Oklahoma waterfowl season, uh, starting mid-November, run right until uh, mid-February through the end goose season. And um, and they were a full service operation, and uh, you know provide everything from uh, birds to uh, food, to alcohol, fantastic lodging, and uh, hopefully complement it with wonderful service as well. Yeah, you know, obviously people want to have good hunts, but really when you go on a trip like this, you want to have a great experience. And come in here to be able to relax where, where we are upstairs in your, your bar area up here and overlooking kind of where people dine and relax by the fireplace. It's, it's, a, it's a nice lodge. It's a comfortable place. And the, the food is amazing. Thank you, bud. Uh, that's all Brian Pilgreen down in the kitchen. Uh, give him full credit for all that. Yeah, t- tell, tell everybody like what they, what they would eat here when they come here. Yeah, man. So uh, first night when you get here, you're going to eat an 82-day-old aged, wet-aged oh, ribeye. Really? Come on. Uh, I did have one of those, and it was delicious, but I didn't realize that it was Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like and, and Brian does an incredible job with that. And while Brian is so good, is that steak is going to taste the same every time you come. Mm. Um, he is just... A perfectionist and he does everything exactly the same and when it works he's not going to mess it up so uh it's it's been fantastic so far but uh yeah so you're gonna have a steak and you know some vegetables um and then the dessert is kind of becoming what we're known for i think even over um hunting birds and stuff like that it's a butter fried honey bun Oh with boy. homemade vanilla ice cream on top, <laughs> and it is unbelievable. Um, everybody, oh, you know, when we ask if people want dessert, everybody's like, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, you're getting dessert. You don't have a choice. <laughs> the answer is yes. Give them dessert. But uh, anyway, yeah, man, Brian does an amazing job, and he uh, is just – he's the one person we knew we could trust with this lodge. So when our guests are here – We know they're getting an incredible experience because he is all about customer service and uh, he's all he loves to serve people and he loves to cook and stuff like that so he uh he's he's amazing well we we had that prime rib the first night when we got here and we had eaten on the way down here like we didn't expect to get a meal when we got here thank you very much but we went out there and and brian's like okay he's got the slab of meat there and he's like all right do you want the end piece do you want a piece more in the middle and i'm just like yes (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I will eat the whole thing. And I had an end piece, and it was huge. And I could have gone back and eaten yeah. the rest. Of it. So, yeah, it's funny. So every dinner has the word rib in it. It's either a ribeye or ribs or prime ribs. So um, if you're here for two nights, you're going to have the steak, and then you're going to have ribs the next night, and they're fantastic. Um, or we think they are. Our, our guests do, too. But uh, And then for lunch, first day you're going to come in, you're going to have my favorite meal, which is homemade fried chicken. Um, can we talk have, about that fried chicken? Can we, yeah. t- can we talk about the secret ingredient in there? I don't know. Is, that a, is that a secret? I don't we, know. I don't know if we, it's just know that when you come here, there's a secret ingredient in yeah. that fried chicken that make it, your toes curl. It was crazy because you, you mentioned that to us when we were talking about the meals the other night. You told us about this fried chicken. And we were talking about a lot of things, and it had been a long day. So I was like, gosh, what, what was that ingredient? I couldn't remember what it was yeah. you were talking about. Then I took a bite of that fried chicken today. And you're like, there it is. There it is. There it you is. You knew it exactly. So we'll do fried chicken, mashed potatoes, homemade gravy, fried okra, honey butter biscuits, uh, black eyed peas. And then the next day for lunch, usually when clients are leaving, uh, if they're doing two days, and we'll do hamburgers and the best fries you've ever had in your life. I want to talk about, uh, I want to stay with you for just okay. one second, because when we were talking about the meals and everything else, you kind of went into the experience that you want people to have yeah. here, and, and it's more than hunting here, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, I think one thing that we're all passionate about is uh, building relationships, and, you know, we've all killed a pile of birds, and we still love to shoot birds in the face, and I say that a lot, but it's so true. Um, and and that, that doesn't ever get old. And we right. did. We have. Yeah. But uh, that's not nece- that isn't necessarily a thing that we're the most passionate about. And uh, we wanted this place to be a safe place if you wanted to bring your daughter or your wife or, um, you know, your entire family. We want this to be a place where everyone feel, feels comfortable. Um, we like to have a good time and have a cocktail by the fire and, and you know, laugh and pick on each other. Um, but it's not just all about the party here. Um, and I think that's the atmosphere we were wanting to create. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound like this is a dull place cause it ain't, right. there's some <laughs> right. really funny stuff that happens up in here, but, um, you know, we just want it. We want the atmosphere to be safe. If yeah. you, if you wanted to bring somebody that, you know, it's For not sure. just a bunch of drunk dudes. Yeah. Right. And luckily right. we're, we're getting to the point now where. We're hunting with people that we love, and, and, and every hunt's a buddy hunt. Yeah. And that's what we want. And we can do that when we hunt 16 people a day. Well, you can have a professional operation and still have fun with Oh, no, yeah, too. no, I mean, no doubt, we do. And, and man, when you talk about the hunting, um, Aaron, t- tell, us, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about that mallard hunt that we were on yesterday, because when we went out there, it was, it was real dark we got out there early because i know jd you wanted to check the the landscape out a little bit and it was it was water we were hunting on and i you know in the dark i have no idea i've never been there before and not sure how deep it is it's a big really shallow uh backwater or overflow or like mm-hmm. a flooded creek area yeah. whatever however right. you want to describe it it's a but, retention pond is okay. what it is uh, i mean just a giant in, in essence, it's a giant retention pond. A lot of the reservoirs around here were built uh, as flood control structures back in the 1930s. Um, and they, you wouldn't believe how fast the water, just a little bit of runoff can fluctuate in a spot like that. But um, just like in the woods back home in Arkansas, a certain river level hit at a certain spot in the White River bottoms and mallards instinctively go to that particular spot. Um, hmm. That reservoir, as the water goes up and it changes, goes into those trees, uh, you know they seem to like it more I, I think as i've watched that reservoir particular one and studied over the years there's a, a right to the center of it i mean i'm sure the guys will see on the video if they watch the one you guys put out but um the original creek channel has a series of trees through it and you can particularly notice they use a lot on bluebird day uh i believe to hide from aerial predators underneath those things uh, sure and be in the center of the reservoir at the same time so i mean there's a correlation between that spot and i think the other thing is it's down in depression so um I, you know mallard they usually don't play fair, particularly in January, so right. that's always a good spot to check. Um, yeah. And John David made a great call on the hunt yesterday by uh, putting extra effort in to get out into the middle of it, where they really wanted to be anyways, and I think that paid off dividends on that particular hunt for sure. Yeah, we sat on a little island, and when we got out to it, it just was tracks. Just not mm-hmm. not an inch on that little island or that little island next yeah, to it. Yeah, didn't have any tracks. 
didn't have track site. Yeah, completely, completely covered. And they would kind of come, and they would. we didn't have a whole lot of wind. So we had a little bit of wind, but they were kind of working behind us. But then they'd come kind of right over the top and just bomb right in. Sit right down. And it was, the sun was behind us. Like, the colors were amazing. And, it, you know, and I was, I didn't, I never picked up my gun. You know, I just worked a camera, and it was, it was a really cool hunt to be yeah. a part of. It was a lot of fun to watch those birds. And I got on film, I got one mallard that dropped in, and there was ducks working all over the place above us. So, obviously, we weren't going to shoot at this one mallard. I think it was a pair originally. But one drake just hovered over the decoys for, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. I don't think he even really moved from one spot, just hovering like, I remember that are, th- are those really my friends down yeah. there? Yeah. I don't know. He kind of went a few different places, you know, like looking. Grab that mic right there, yeah. Yeah, he, he went a few different places looking for a place to land. He went over <laughs> here and then turned and went over here, you know. It was, I right. remember that duck you're talking about. Gosh, I was jealous, though, seeing all those pintails coming in like that, that close. Just Well, that, that, that reservoir particularly is a place that you let rest. Yeah. You let it sit, you let it build and build and build and build, and then uh, they come back with an improved attitude after you let them sit there for about a week or so. Right. I think every time we've had a successful hunt on it's been a result of just letting her be, you know. Comfortable duck comes back in a certain way. I like to see that. So. That was fun. Mallards and pintails, you can't beat it this time of year. The all colored up, big, nice, uh, mature birds, big, big, you know, uh, sprigs on those pintails. Uh, is that, do you guys hunt? Uh, mallards mostly or do you hunt uh, uh, little Canada geese or snows or what do you guys like to target man we like to target whatever there's the most of Um, again like I said we like to shoot birds in the face so we're going where there's the most of them (laughs) Um, I mean I have grown to really love goose hunting I never goose hunted a lot being from South Arkansas um, I always like to shoot mallard ducks that was always the goal sure and over here our mind has been blown a little bit you know um the sheer amount of mallards that are here and your off duck might be a widgeon or you know we're back home it's spoonbills and you know a lot of gadwalls which i love shooting all those but um, that, that i'd rather have widgeon than spoonbills oh yeah no yeah, offense sure. i love spoonies I love in the spoonies spring too. But they're fast they're fun to shoot yeah, but uh anyway yeah so i love to hunt mallards over water really so uh that's that's my favorite my brother if i could if i could choose anything that's what we would do um and this season has just been it's been a dream season yeah um 100 i mean we were we were talking the other day it could end right now it could quit and this has been the best season of our life that we've ever had um and i think that's that goes for everyone uh, that guides for us and, and everything. I mean, there's 250 duck seasons right here um, in this group, and we've all said the same wow. thing. It's been unreal. Yeah, expl- and, explain what you mean by that. Just yeah, um, meaning like weather patterns earlier in the year. We had a big cold front in October, pushed a lot of birds down early, where usually we don't have a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> we got eight inches of snow in that cold front yeah, in October. We were, yeah. and we were cheering down here. We were fired <laughs> up. And we, but, you know, we got a big ice storm here. I mean, it was, it was pretty bad, but brought a bunch of birds down. And uh, those birds stuck around, and we just continually had a good push of birds throughout the season. And, uh, I mean, we, we were talking the other day, we were completely spoiled. I mean, this season spoiled us. So next next season we could just be twiddling our thumbs a little bit. <laughs> I, I put uh, the direct success of this season to the hatch, particularly okay. on ducks. I don't know if, you know, the geese had as good a hatch um, – because of lack of research from COVID and everything, but right. we've killed three hybrids this year. Uh, That's pin, crazy. Pintail mallard hybrid, uh, widgeon mallard hybrid, and a wood duck mallard hybrid, which was the unicorn. Uh, I, I, anytime you see that many hybrids mm-hmm. in one season, that's a sure sign of high duck numbers. You know? That that was it was a wood duck mallard hybrid, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I that's saw right. that. I shared that on the Sporting Journal Radio mm-hmm. Instagram page, and that duck was. I've never seen anything like that yeah, before. It was I, yeah. beautiful. It, it was incredibly unique. You yeah. Know? I, it almost looked like it wanted to be a merganser in a weird <laughs> way because of the bill and everything. Um, but, yeah, anybody can go to Falco Outfitters' social media and check out pictures of it because it really is something to see. Yeah. Where's that duck now? Taxidermist. Yeah. Yeah. The the client, or is it going to end up here it's in the lodge? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Let's do that. That's right. Our taxidermist drove from Fort Smith and picked up 
those two birds, and now he's probably going to turn around and come pick up this widgeon mallard cross. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, he, like, made a special trip up here to go get those, take them back, and uh, get them rolling. So. That's way cool. Uh, when you, I wanted you to explain, too, when you say 250 seasons, you're talking about the experience of the people working here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just how long we've been hunting. I mean, I've been hunting for 35 years since I was five. I mean, so Aaron, Sam, and Harold's been hunting – his whole life jc's been hunting his whole life um so it just starts to add up right you know and uh, that's what i mean and you you brought up something too that so this is this is season three for you guys here yes um everybody that you started with pretty much everybody that you started with is still here yeah the same people we have an amazing group of uh, guys that work for us great hunters great people um and to be honest i mean like I feel like the Lord just allowed us to get the right guys at the right time when we started this thing because, for one, um, we don't want turnover, right. especially with our guides. We want all these clients that we love and that trust us and love us, they now love and trust our guides. And uh, that's, the, that's the trust that we want in between not just us, the owners, but between the clients and the guides that work for us. You know, they're not just hired help. Those dudes... Um, they're running this thing truly i mean they're the ones finding the birds and we trust them every day of like trust me it's a good hunt or no i don't think we need to hunt it we think we need to let it rest we've gotten year three we've gotten to where we really trust their their judgment and uh try not to you know micromanage them as much but uh I think they would probably disagree i think they probably think that we do but <laughs> of course um anyway yeah i mean so we, uh, yeah, man, we've got the same group that's been here, and I hope they stay forever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you guys started this three years ago. There's three of you that started it, right? We're missing one of them right now. Yeah, Josh Tiff. All right. He's sick. Not he's, feeling well. He's not feeling well. I uh, got to meet him, though. Nice guy. Um, when, when you guys started this, do you, did you ever think that by year three you'd have the dream season that, you know, do you, did you ever think you'd be this big and have this much success by and year honestly, three? Honestly, everything um, about Falco just in general from, from the moment that we, three of us sat down over a plate of barbecue to basically draw this idea up on a napkin and all the, you know, steps that had to be taken, everything has been mind-blowing. But I, and John David, Josh's opinion may differ, but um, – for me, we've already kind of hit our my ten year goal. What I had in my head, oh, wow. uh, you know, we're close to it. I, mean, I know there's some bigger steps there, but um, sure. as far as like uh, the culture that we've created, um, you know, our relationships with our employees, relationships with our customers, the landowners out here, uh, you know, the way I saw it, you know, being eight to ten years down the road, I, I, we're we're there, and um, it, which which means our our goals are even bigger now because you just push them further. Yeah, if you, right. you know, you buy yourself more time. Uh, yeah. To, to, to go bigger, badder, and faster when you want to, you know, and that, so that feels good, knowing that, like, maybe there's room over the you know, next decade for us to, to make things even better than they already are, and I think that's the ultimate goal, for sure. sure, you know? sure. We well, got a, uh, a great location here. Uh, was it, did this, I know we talked a little bit off the air about things just kind of falling into place. With this location, with the big, uh, you know, slew here, oh, that you're overlooking a big body of water, basically, that you guys have managed for ducks, right? Down right, there? Right. It's a 116 acre, uh, generally a flooded cornfield. Uh, this year it has some corn in it, but we lost quite a bit of it to a big, hard summer rain this oh, year. Sure. Um, but it was just an agricultural field when we purchased the property. That. I didn't know that was flooded corn down there. Yeah, yeah, there's some in there. Last year at this time. Uh, yeah, nice. yeah. But that's been cool because it's not, there's not a lot of shallow water on food out here. So, uh, I mean, it really attracts the ducks and just brings a whole waterfowl vibe to the property in right. itself, you know. And that's and you'll hunt that. You'll Absolutely. hunt that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll nice do. short drive for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just take the uh, the can am right right from the lodge down yeah. there, I suppose, huh? Yeah, no, this is this is great. So did you like whose idea was this? Did you all kind of come was it been brewing for a while? Yeah, me and Aaron started um, talking about it, gosh, five years ago. Five years ago, we started talking about, you know, let's let's start an operation. Like, you know, it sounded great, and then it got to a point where like we're we're freaking doing, we're gonna do it. Um, and then, uh, you know, through a chain of events, um, Josh got included in that, and 
like Aaron said, we were actually, Aaron and I were turkey hunting. I love telling this story. We're turkey hunting in Oklahoma. Uh, I'll just say we were in Kingfisher. <laughs> but uh, you, if you're a real turkey hunter, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But uh, we're turkey hunting. We're sitting by a tree. There's three turkeys gobbling. And uh, Aaron goes, dude, you need to text Josh. We need to go to man. I'm like, shut up. There's turkeys right here. No. And he's like, no, I'm serious. Text Josh. So I texted Josh anyway. Uh, <laughs> but to, for Aaron to have that thought while turkeys are gobbling, like coming in, <laughs> that's like something was laid on his heart to yeah. like to make that move. And so uh, anyway, so we did. We we called. Uh, text. I texted Josh. We met the following Monday. That was on a Saturday or a Sunday. The next day or the uh, couple days after, we went and ate lunch. Uh, the next day, maybe the next day or the, or the following day, Josh put his two weeks notice in. He was managing a rod and gun club in uh, Northwest Arkansas. And uh, he put his two week notice in. And we had the name and we had everything. And we were really at that point, we were looking uh, – we, we didn't really want to go with the bank. We wanted it to be more personal. So we started looking for people that wanted to back us in it and immediately had a friend of Josh's reach out and uh, said, done deal, build your dream lodge. Really? And uh, which was awesome because he kept pushing us to do it better. And I'm thankful, I'm thank, thankful that we had that or else we'd have been thinking so much about cost that we wouldn't have like, really it it wouldn't be our dream lodge this truly is sure. our dream lodge and people ask us all the time what would you change about it if you could do it again i can't think of one thing that we'd change i was going to ask that question yeah. what, what would you add or what would you change not a dang thing yeah. nothing so anyway so that all played out man we josh and i came over and looked at this land you weren't with us when we looked at it where uh we drug my ranger from northwest arkansas came out here uh, we had heard about a property that a bunch of people owned around the country. And we knew that we wanted a wetland and we wanted the back porch of our lodge to overlook that wetland so you can, you know, stand by the fire, have a cocktail, and watch ducks come in the evening. Well, this is the, I mean, I pulled the it's ranger perfect. where the fire pit is. And we just looked at each other like, this is it. That's tillable farm ground. This is just pasture land up here. We're not going to do anything with it. This is where the lodge will go. Guide quarters over there, you know, and just had that vision. And uh, we purchased the land, I think, in February. We started construction. This is in 18. Started construction the end of April. And then the middle of September, we were finished wow. and fully booked and operational for the duck wow. season in 2018. <laughs> wow. It was, so again, there's just some of those steps that took place that we didn't really have any power over. Right. And uh, so. Wow. It's really cool. That, yeah, that's great. Not just to get it, all the construction done and be ready to go, but to be fully booked. Yeah. Right away. No, that's, uh, that's very cool. Uh, the duck hunt was great. The goose hunt, I, I get excited I get excited to hunt snow geese because I hate them, yeah. but they're my favorite because <laughs> I hate them so much because they're hard to hunt, but yeah. when it works right, there's nothing else like it. Yeah. But there's a lot of really frustrating hunts when you do that. But it also allows you to hunt in a different way like we did today. We put out the white socks. We were able to lay in, in whites and, and hide on backrests yeah. so we didn't have to use layouts or put a panel out in the middle of that field. Um, and, and it worked. I mean, we were hunting mostly the, the darks, the little geese, yeah. and shot a bunch of those, but we had some snows work. We definitely had, had a chance at some snow geese out there. So it's, uh, it's fun. There's a lot of geese around here right now. Yeah, there is. There was a lot more. There was a lot, uh, there was a lot more at one point. But they, they're starting to get a little worked over, flying sure. around with transparent wings and things like that this late <laughs> in the season, you know, from being shot at. Um, <laughs> right. No, I like to uh, I like lay the socks, too, get out there with them. And we do. Central flyaway snow geese are weird. They're strange birds, They're just tough. in general. We, yeah, we, we tend to, you know, really target the cacklers, but we use yeah. the, you know, snow goose hide laying under the socks and whites and stuff uh, to help us ambush them 
middle of wheat fields in the wide open country out here in the West, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a little, little secret for us back in Minnesota. Every once in a while we pull that trick and we don't get a lot of snows where we're at in Western Minnesota. The yeah. few will pass through, but once in a while we'll throw on the whites and go lay under some sock decoys mm. and people just look at us funny and we'll shoot geese. I bet. You know, and, yeah. and, and seen ducks that coming up there. Have they? So Is no, where, you guys do it on graders as well. Yeah. Up there? Cause yeah. y'all shoot mostly graders, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We usually, if we see the cacklers, we just, I mean, we'll call at them and we'll try to get them, but usually they work like snows and they become real difficult. See, that's so interesting. We like the know? big ones. It's so opposite here. But yeah. was, uh, Corey was saying um, today, talking about, you know, working the geese and like laying them off on the corners. Um, and when I got it out in eastern Colorado, we hunted graders a lot out there. And yeah, that was true with them, mm-hmm. you know, like bouncing around corners and these cacklers, uh, it's just you're a different beast, you know. Like, yeah. it's a, different noise at different times and different days they act more like a snow goose they really do but y'all don't have any luck targeting them up home really it's tough really it's tough and a lot of times too we'll be uh once the big migration comes through and some of the the little geese end up coming down because they don't you know we our residents are all big geese uh we'll be we'll be so used to hunting the bigger ones that we'll have you know some maybe little groups of of little geese kind of start to work and we're like man they are really high (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they'll spin and spin and spin and finally at some point we'll, wah, they'll squawk a little bit and like oh they're not as high as they uh, look like they are uh, they're just small geese and then we'll you know we'll shoot into them a little bit so we, we shoot a few but not very much and it's really amazing for guys that haven't shot a lot of those little birds just how small they are oh, yeah. well, they fall hard yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah big yeah. target you know long neck on them right easy. i think they go down as easy as a mallard you know my right opinion. Talk about uh, laying in the whites today. You guys got some some of those new Sika suits, the Nodak system. Yeah, we were we were pretty fired up about that. Um, you know, we've um, we've used a lot of things to lay in whites, a lot of different you know Tyvek suits, which work. And you know, there's some other companies that make some bibs that are that are white and they're just not as comfortable. And of course, we were fired up when we heard that Sika was coming out with whites. Gore Tex was you know Gore Tex whites. Um, one, they they cut the wind. I mean, today they cut. The, it was the first time to hunt in them, and they cut wind, and you can you know they're waterproof and they're Gore-Tex, um, and they're comfortable. You can move around, you can sit, you can bring your knees up, you can squat. You know, I could uh, probably run a four six forty again in those things. <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, Go right. put them on. No, I'll break a hip. Got- <laughs> but uh, no, but uh, yeah, I mean like. That was that was awesome, and also another thing about it. I mean, there's a lot of cool features about them, but um, another cool thing is the white, the color white that it is. It's mm-hmm. not like a bluish white or a, a it's truly white. Um, and I mean, you can really tell it when you hold what you think is white up against that. Right. Um, so anyway, I'm fired up about you know, and then thankful that they, you know brought some of those to us you guys brought some of those to us yeah that's why we're here and it's really amazing you know i've worn white hoodies snow goose hunting so many times you go buy a white hoodie at walmart or or wherever or you order a a white waterfall hoodie from somewhere and then you you lay down the spread and you know you're working geese and and they're just not doing it and then you finally look over at your buddy who's got the same sweatshirt on and it doesn't match you know any of the decoys or you know if it's cloudy or whatever it's a completely it's not white it's yeah. it's a blue it's a completely different color so the color on these things are amazing and then aaron when you tried them on when we delivered those cory loffler and i delivered those whites i think i heard you say that's smart and i'm going to use the accent just a little bit there too yeah, now that yeah. i've been here a couple of days uh you said that's smart i don't know how many times as you were looking at all the different features on the on that suit yeah uh man i'm maybe the hardest person on hunting gear on the planet i don't i'm hard on everything (laughs) that i touch in general i just yeah i just am that guy i own it at this point um and every set of bibs i've ever owned uh this is the main thing that stuck out to me that the uh zipper on the side of the leg has blown out on every pair of bibs i've owned in my lifetime uh that particular one the way the snaps come up the side it kind of just eliminates the ability for mud to get in there that's awesome the flap up here is awesome the way they cut them down the leg for you to open them up real quick fantastic i don't know uh, another genius product by sika ultimately the hood cut back to where you can yeah. see yeah. yeah you can see out the sides i don't know and for me uh i'm not a very big guy built like a horse jockey so uh a lot of times you know trying to find good hunting clothes in the past is always hard because everything seemed to swallow me uh, mm-hmm. and, and 
I have luck with, you know, getting stuff, sick of gear that, that actually fits me and I don't step on the cuffs of a yeah. pair of bibs. I mean, every other pair of bibs, I don't know, almost had to, like, you know, get new tread on the end of them after I wear them out. I so. do the same thing. That's right. Like, I've, I got a weird shape to me a little bit. I'm 6'2", but it's like, I don't know, I've got, like, part of me is the wrong size. Like, half of me is the wrong size when it comes to comes to A clothing. lot of torso. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, but I, and I... And I know you had a similar situation. Like, I got ended up getting a, a size smaller. Like, Corey, I, I ordered a bunch of Sitka stuff, and I'm like, Corey, you know, because he's, he's a little bit smaller than I am, but I was kind of picking his brain about what size he wears so I can try to figure out, and I'm using the size charts and all that, but it's nice to talk to somebody that's tried all the gear on. It's like, well, I'm going to order this. What size should I get? You know, because I'm, like I'm like an XL in T-shirts. I buy 3X in sweatshirts because cause I'm long. Like, I... If I, a two X, like it's big. I like, I like them a little oversized anyway, but once I wash it and I put my arms up like this then the, you know, the sweatshirt comes halfway up my body. So I get a three X and it's like, that's a perfect length for me. So I was telling him that he's like, dude, I wear mediums. Like you, you don't need, you don't need a two X or a three X or any of that stuff. So I ended up getting, I think I got large bibs, which I was real scared about. And then I put them on and they were perfect, like fit perfect. So fit true to size too. Yeah. True to size. Yeah. Yeah. That's one. I mean, across the board, one thing that I really like about Sigma gear, uh, I know this isn't like a Sigma gear commercial, but right. um, one, we're in it all day and it really does cut wind and keeps us dry. Um, but two, I was nervous at first because I was thinking, Oh gosh, this is like skinny jeans. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm a, Ex nose guard, my butt and thighs. There's no way I'm fitting in any of this stuff. And it looks like I'm not going to fit in it. And then I put it on and it fits me perfectly. Yeah. And I can move in it. And so, like, even for bigger guys, like, for me, being a bigger guy, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just, like Aaron said, it really fits us really well. well so. It's good, durable, waterproof yep. gear that doesn't make, isn't bulky. And that's I'm not right. trying to make this commercial either. It's just, it's just, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by them. And yeah. obviously, that's why we're here, is because Corey and I delivered some of those new white suits to you guys down here. So, uh, we, we were looking forward to stopping here. We, you know, we're making stops all along the place. We were looking forward to it. I appreciate you guys. Dude, we it. loved having y'all. It was. Uh, Corey's a little weird, but <laughs> you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> now, you guys, uh, you guys have known Corey. You've known Corey for a while. Man, right? this is actually the first time that we've met face to face. Okay. But we've talked a lot on the phone, which is funny. It's like, it's almost like we were dating for a little while, you know? <laughs> no, uh, but uh, no, Corey and I, we have a lot, we have a lot of mutual friends. Um, and we've talked on the phone quite a bit. And finally, we made it work to where he could run through here. And he delivered some sweet gear. So. Yeah, right. That was cool. The short drop is an incredible call. Oh. I, 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 Corey's not even up here. I get nothing by saying this. Uh, I mean, the versatility of it, um, the ease of blowing. I, I can go like sound like full grader, or I can go squeak. Doesn't matter. Um, it, it is. It, it, I, and I think even for a, you know, a medium range guys still learning to kind of you know get fast and get good. I think it'd be a, you know a good call to like develop somebody, help them push through to the next level. It's an easy call to run. It is. It is yeah. an easy call to run. So yeah, props to Corey for that. Fantastic call. Short drop. Yeah, he makes a really good goose call, and he uh, makes some really good Timberwolf. So, anyway, <laughs> <that> was, right. <laughs> yeah. Friend of ours killed it in Canada, and we got to eat it here. We were thankful. How crazy is that? Crazy. It was delicious. First time I've eaten ever eaten dog. And I'm telling you, it's not that bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that short drop, I just want to say, like, I'm not a great goose caller either. I, I'm all right. But that short, I, I run that all the time, even yeah. up north when I'm hunting bigger geese, too, because it is very versatile. You can do, it's got a lot of range for, for a, a small, easy to call the blow that's designed to be high pitched. It's got a lot of range. Yeah, it really a lot of does. Versatility. It Check really it does. So, yeah. That's one thing I told Corey, you know, we were talking, and I said, my favorite thing is how versatile it is. Yeah how high you can go and how low you can go. And, uh, I mean, this is coming from somebody who's only been blowing a goose call for three years now, mm -hmm. you know. But um, I feel like that call has allowed me to really progress um, in my goose calling. So, anyway, sure. yeah, uh, there's not another call we'll, we'll blow. 
That's great. At these small geese or any geese. Well, the season, uh, you guys are about to wrap up the season, or how, how long do you guys go here now? Uh, duck season ends the 31st of January. 31st, okay. And uh, goose season is over February 14th, I believe, right around Valentine's Day. Okay, and you'll run clients through then? Yep, yep, yep. Nice. We do one group a day in February, just eight people. Okay. Just, I, by that point, uh, just targeting geese and half our crew heads to uh, Arkansas for snow goose season. Okay, do you run spring yeah. snows sure then do. too? Yep. All right. Sure do. Yeah, that's, gosh, that's a lot of fun. That's so much fun. So go book a hunt there you in go. Arkansas <laughs> with Falco. There you go. And then uh, back again next fall, you guys start opening mid-November, is that what you said? Yeah, start so uh, dove season oh, doves. is, uh, we have dynamite dove hunting out here. I think we killed 3,000 dove last year. Whoa, um, jeez. Yeah, I mean, it's unreal. It usually times out really well when these farmers are cutting their milo and these fields get silly. Um, so anyway, yeah, we will start dove hunts, um, September and, uh, then we run through October. No, we run through September and get back over here first of November and start running groups this year. I think our first group was a 12. So, yeah. Uh, doves, by the way. So my TV show, Prairie Sportsman, we just started our new season last Sunday night on Pioneer PBS and our, our first episode uh, we did some fishing in inside the Twin Cities Metro, and then the guy we went fishing with, uh, he has a program in Minnesota where he introduces um, a Spanish-speaking community to the outdoors. So it's primarily fishing, but it's hunting and fishing. So we had him tell his story. Well, his dad, the, he grew up in Chicago, and his dad introduced him to the outdoors to keep him off the streets, basically, to keep him away from... Uh, drugs crime you know a lot of his friends ended up in jail or uh, uh or ended up dead got into a lot of trouble so i said all right i got a dove hunt coming up i want you to bring your dad with because his dad grew up hunting doves in mexico with a slingshot whoa so i'm just gonna let that sink in just for a minute hunting hunting doves with a slingshot so i had him bring his dad out to tell his story of of growing up and then raising his son uh <laughs> so so he introduced his kid to the outdoors to keep him away from drugs and crime. And I took him hunting in a hemp field. <laughs> That's where we went. <laughs> and we smashed. So I don't know yeah. if hemp has come to Oklahoma or Arkansas or down here for you guys, or if they can, I think they can grow it down in the southern, uh, yeah, southern climate. Yeah, it's still pretty regulated um, pretty heavily just because of, I think, all the, yeah, just because of, I think it's still regulated pretty heavily because. What trying to say is that the doves are doing it. The doves are doing it in the hemp field, yeah, dude. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> dude, yeah, man. It's crazy. Like, uh, he didn't get it. He didn't well, the, uh, and the hemp has to be less than 0.03% for it with THC or else yeah, they destroy right. the whole crop. And it's been uh, legalized to grow now in the United States, and the doves absolutely love it. Like, we shot... Uh, there was five of us, and we can shoot, what, 15 apiece, and we shot our 15 in no time. So. Well, the more you know. <laughs> there you go. Now for hemp now. That's like right. It. So Grow more hemp. Start, start a hemp field hey. at Falco. The new cash crop. Yeah, there you go. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate the time. Uh, Thank you. You guys got a great business here. Thanks for having us, and uh, good luck with everything you Thank you so much. In the future. Bro. You're coming back, right? Yeah, I'm not okay. leaving. Okay. Mean, oh, that's back. right. Corey and I July. Until July. <laughs> Mid to late July. Thank you, man. <laughs> this has been the Finding Fur and Feathers Hunting Podcast, part of the Sporting Journal Radio family. Subscribe wherever you get podcasts or visit us at findingfurandfeathers.com. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. 
Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Come ice fish the famous waters of Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, the walleye capital of the world. Experience full-service resorts featuring heated fish houses, ice transportation, meal plans, and sleeper house options. From the northwest angle to the south shore, Rainy River and Baudette, the Midwest's number one ice fishing destination. Walleye, Sauger, Perch, and Northern Pike, Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, best fishing anywhere. For more information, log on to lakeofthewoodsmn.com. On X Hunt, ever heard of it? Next time you see that guy at your local shop who always punches his tag on a stud whitetail, ask him. He'll tell you about the most trusted source for mapping. With nationwide landowner names, private and public land boundaries, including walk-in areas, map tools to mark spots, and the ability to view your maps without cell service. And that's just scratching the surface. It's your time to be known as the big buck guy around town. Download the leader in hunt mapping on Google Play or the App Store. On X Hunt, know where you stand.